The Washington Post, as we mentioned, was one of the first papers to deploy a bot that writes articles, this program called Heliograph. Absolutely. So Heliograph starts with human editors and reporters. So we are from the very beginning saying the narrative, as he was alluded to, is very much shaped by humans. How do we quantify and automate the editorial judgment that goes into saying what's most important? How do we support that most important thought? What are other thoughts that are important? And then also is an automation of the process of sifting through data, which humans can do, but potentially systems and computers can do faster. But the other thing that I think is really important about our approach is that we want to be very transparent. We want to be transparent not only about when stories are written by algorithms, but also why we have expertise from our human reporters. So that transparency is not just, are you talking to a machine, are you talking to a human? Human, but rather, how do we know that the post and the particular authors of the articles of the post have some expertise that really matters on the topic? And we explain specifically that Heliograph is an artificial intelligent agent that the post employs to tell specific kinds of stories. I, it has nothing to do with a computer taking anyone's job in the same way that just because we have spell check doesn't mean that we don't need editors to read over our stories. So of course, those are two very different things. Sure, well, AI is a very general umbrella term. Uh, it's been around for a long time, 30, 40 years or so, and we use that to describe all kinds of things, basically whenever a system kind of exhibits human-like behavior. Um, what's happened in the last few years is that a particular kind of AI, a particular technique known as machine learning, has made enormous strides. Um, and you mostly through the use of something called, called deep neural networks, which is a structure that kind of mimics the way the brain works. What, what that has changed is now um, machines can solve a lot of problems that used to be um, really hard for machines, much easier for humans. Problems of recognition and classification, first and foremost. So things that require a little bit of judgment, um, you know, fuzzy fitting things together now um, can be handled really easily by this class of algorithms. It's generally putting some words around a bunch of numbers. Um, we don't think we need to write those stories at all. We think our readers want, you know, the analysis, the insight, the original reporting that we're going to pull. Although I think we're probably all going to have to get a little comfortable with being robust some things as, the, as time goes by. I absolutely believe that the world-class reporters and editors we have in the post are the reason that our audience comes to us. I wonder if you could answer a question from Willix, who tweeted, I don't understand how this works. In order to get the story, journalists spend hours talking with people and reading between the lines to get the story. Who are these computers talking to? <laughs> uh, no one. So we're still starting from the same place. We're still starting from our reporters and editors thinking about what kinds of data we might find and how they would interpret that data. Marion in Louisville, Kentucky writes, I don't know if our local paper is using robots or AI for their stories, but they can certainly use a good editor. I consistently find spelling and grammar errors. Ah! Brent in DC feels very similarly. Brent writes, can you use AI to eliminate, for example, copy editors? While watching Showtime's The Fourth Estate, I see Dean McKay of the New York Times struggle with the changing nature of the news business. Isn't AI a perfect tool to implement painful but perhaps necessary changes major news organizations are grappling with? Where's the ethical line for you with AI in journalism? What are the thou shalt nots for AI? I would never want us to use use AI to make recommendations that just played into people's biases or prejudices. Jeremy Gilbert is Director of Strategy at the Washington Post. Jeremy, we really appreciate your time, sir. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you. And Nick Rockwell is the Chief Technology Officer at the New York Times. Nick, thanks very much. Thank you. Let's bring in two more voices now as we turn toward the potential consequences of AI in journalism. Joining us from NPR in New York is Rubina Madon Filia, the Director of Audience Engagement at The Intercept. Rubina, welcome to 1A. Thank you, it's good to be here. Joining us from Minnesota Public Radio is John Keefe, a developer at the Quartz Bot Studio. He's also a professor at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism in New York. John, glad to have you with us. Hi. Rubina, let me start with you where I ended with Jeremy and Nick. What would you say is a thou shalt not of AI and journalism? What should be a hard, bright red line? I, I believe that, um, that, that what they said about editorial judgment, it was, uh, was really on point. Um, one thing that algorithms can't do is, um, is, is be held accountable for the decisions that they make. It is more difficult to be able to um, explain to readers exactly how you arrived at a decision. Um, often, um, often but we don't know themselves. Uh, as, as, we, as we realized when we watched uh, Mark Zuckerberg present in front of Congress, uh, for example, that he wasn't able to, to really answer all the questions about the news feed because it had been manipulated uh, by other agents. If I could add to that, Rubina, I think also Mark Zuckerberg could answer some of those questions because he didn't know. Let's look back at a conference that took place in 2016, a few days before the presidential election. Adobe unveiled a prototype program that was capable of editing a person's voice. Now, here's some audio from the demonstration, and the voices you'll hear are Keegan-Michael Key and Jordan Peele, stars uh, for Comedy Central series Key and Peele. Uh, I jumped out of the bed, and, um, and uh, uh, I kissed my dogs and my wife, in that order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how about we uh, mess with uh, who he actually kissed? Uh, we have to type something that's not here. So, I, I heard that, uh, actually, that on that day, uh, Michael actually kissed uh, our Jordan. So, sorry. to recover the truth, let's do it. So, let's remove the word my here. Your secret's out. So. And yes. so, just uh, type the word Jordan. And play back. And uh, uh, I kissed Jordan three times. That was from a demo that Adobe put on back in 2016. <laughs> I think that um, 
in, in the future, there are going to be lots of jobs, and, and futurists um, are speculating on this already. Even 10, 20 years from now, there will be lots of jobs that are going to be replaced by AI. You know, I'm from public radio. It is entirely possible for somebody just using today's tools, uh, just editing digital editing tools, to cre c completely restate what somebody has said and play that back. Um, as journalistic organizations, we don't do that because we we traffic in trust and truth. As journalistic organizations, we don't do that because we we traffic in trust and truth. But it is, as we know, completely possible to alter images, audio, and even video now to make it look very, very real. And I think that's that has big implications of for what we as humans see and believe is true. You're absolutely right about that. I I worry about how um, quickly we're going to be able to what we're going to be seeing videos that are going to be completely fabricated as well. So when you see uh, Donald Trump and, and the way that he reacts to the woman when he gets off the bus, that could also be completely fabricated. Um, the fabric of our democracy depends on people being able to trust the primary source material that journalists put out. And we often have um, accompanying audio, video, or documents to back up the information that we're putting out there for readers. If it's possible, to seamlessly edit audio and video in the way that we just heard with um, with um, Key and Peele, then that means that people have even less reason to trust news sources. Already we see that people on either side of the political spectrum, on, on across the political spectrum, are much less likely to trust news organizations that um, that are perceived to be on the opposite side of the spectrum. And um, if, if you can suddenly start changing the primary source material or completely fabricating it, um, that is becomes a weapon for, um, for politicians as well. In the same way that the entire narrative about fake news was um, kind of mangled to include real news that included mistakes, um, or, or, or real news that people perhaps disagreed with. Um, the entire um, the, the entire industry of fake videos and audio could be used to completely deteriorate trust in the media and in, in the primary source materials that we provide. Hell no. Absolutely not. Because all I need is for someone to hear enough of the source material of my voice and then monkey around with it, and they could possibly anyway by just stringing together episodes of 1A, and then make me say whatever they want to say. And, and, and now even memes today that pictures don't represent the truth often. Um, I think we're just going to be extending that into things like audio and video, and we as people are going to have to find other ways to determine what is true. We as journalists are going to have to uh, also try to figure out how we maintain the trust in the people who turn to us to say, yes, this is true, this, that we are presenting you with what is true. To say, yes, this is true, this, that we are presenting you with what is true. This sort of ground truth that we know from history and propaganda and as journalistic organizations we don't do that because we we traffic in trust and truth to make people more likely to trust you and um and yeah increased transparency i'm not sure if i mean we could use ai in terms of combating fake news um, facebook has certainly tried to do that one way that they could combat fake news for example is to go through and and check against multiple sources to make sure this is actually verified information, and if it's not, to pre prevent it from proliferating on these platforms. And then monkey around with it, and it could possibly anyway, by just stringing together episodes of 1A, and then make me say whatever they want to say. Even more cover to call that story fake news. Big Brother rules again. Who is picking the stories we read? Bias reigns supreme. People are now telling me to get all their news on their iPhone. They believe they know what is going on in our society by just reading what some algorithm has determined they should read. The end is near. Hello, my name is Joshua Johnson, and I am the host of the NPR program, 1A. Clearly, as you can probably tell, AI voice replication is not perfect, but it is developing quickly.